morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Uh, it's Thanksgiving in the U.S. today, but uh, not here in Canada. Though so every day we should be thankful. So we're thankful that people can be here for the study. And uh, before we begin, can we invite the Lord's presence? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have each morning uh, to open your word together. And we pray that as we uh, seek to understand your word and your will for us today, um, that your Holy Spirit can teach us, comfort us, and show us your glory. We pray for each person. You know the struggles that they face. And we just ask uh, that you can help each one. We lift up each other in prayer. For those that are studying this message, we ask uh, that you can help them in their day-to-day -day life, that they can seek you. And we pray, Lord, that as we uh, look at Revelation or Daniel chapter 11, that your Holy Spirit uh, can continue to lead and guide. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, welcome again, everyone. So yesterday, oh, uh, we we started um, drawing Daniel chapter 11, dealing with the kingdom of Greece. We started drawing that on a line. And um, of course, we're going to run into some difficulties. It's not the easiest thing to do. Um, we have to make some decisions, and those decisions, of course, are not going to be uh, arbitrary decisions. Those decisions need to be based upon uh, what's in God's word. And yet, you know, in some ways, we know that there's the human element here. We, we're doing the best that we can, asking God to help us, and so we're going to make some mistakes. Now, we already drew part of this on a line. So, to go over to this document here. Now, this line was the result of all of the, the details. Um, basically, it's going to go up to, uh, this, is, this is really dealing with the fall of the Soviet Union, but it reaches how the, there's this transition from the Soviet Union to uh, the United States, this um, atheistic communism, this wokeism, right? So this idea of what the dragon power is, globalism, and that moves to the United States. And that's primarily what this is about, this, this line that we have here. Um, now, the line that we're drawing here is, is definitely a related line. So this line is going to be related to it. It's the same history, um, but it's connecting this not so much with what's happening in the United States on an internal level, uh, but it's going to be bringing us to the symbol of midnight in some way. So whether that, no, or or maybe the midnight cry, maybe Panea, maybe the other one just kind of brings us uh, maybe to the beginning of Raphia. This is going to bring us farther. At least, you know, those are the things that we we are, for lack of a better word, supposing, right? Now that supposition is not based upon mere guessing. It has to do with the symbols that are in God's word. And so that's, that's how we derive these lines. And now we have these dates and these dates that we had on the other line. Some of those dates will be on this line. Um, and so we started drawing this line out. And we still had the time at the end, uh, dealing with 1989 um, to 91. That's 776 or 777 days, depending on how you count it. Um, and then we have on there September 11th as the formalization of the message that arrived as the time of the end. And then we have January 20th, 2021. So that's going to be um, Biden being confirmed as president of the United States. So this first message is addressing that transfer from the Soviet Union, uh, this idea of globalism, atheistic communism, the dragon power, whatever you want to call it, the king of the south, um, 
to the United States. So that's going to be the first message. Now, then the second message um, has to in some way relate to the first message. So we have period of darkness, and we have to know what that darkness is and what this message is. So why is this transition considered a message, right? So those are some of the questions that we have to ask. And it could be that we're wrong in how we're doing this line, right? So maybe there's something that we haven't seen yet, something that we need to be corrected on, some assumptions we're making that are wrong. But at this point, this is how we do it. We go through, we study, and we place these things on a line. And when we do that, God usually gives us insight into our history, into ourselves, into this movement, uh, and into what's happening in the world. And so uh, when we're looking at the world, it's very easy to read into the events of you know, the news and say, um, yeah, this is this is happening or that is happening based upon guessing. And I'm not really a fan of guessing about things. I want to have something solid and God's word is solid. So um so that's what we're doing here right now. We're looking at this line and trying to to place it, uh, place these events on a line. So if we have a period of darkness and you have a message regarding um, the dragon power, this means this, this message is about light that comes to us in regard to uh, this, this dragon power. Now, we remember, and, and also under the undercurrent of this has to do with the Sunday law. So we know the Sunday law has uh, three powers that have a union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And when we're dealing with Greece, we're dealing with globalists, right? Globalism. Okay, so Greece represents uh, the globalists. Uh, in some ways, it takes that place of Egypt, right? So Egypt also has that symbol, as does Greece. Now, we don't have that symbol so much with Medo Persia or with Babylon, right? They, they have different symbols attached to them, different characteristics. We know Greece also has education attached to it, the philosophy, the Greek philosophy. And we can see how that's connected to atheistic communism, right? So it's uh, connected to that, that idea of this worldly secular philosophy. It is it's not so much a religion as it is a, a philosophy, atheism. I mean, it has its religious aspects, but it's it's the worship of man. You get humanism. So you can see how the UN ties into that. Um, and so we know that we would have a, in our understanding of things, the line of Greece is to give us an understanding about our own lines, something that we did not understand. And that through time uh, comes to be understood. So one of the things that was not well understood is the role that um, atheism played as far as the dragon power. So if we think about what we used to think, so I know not everybody was there in the 1990s, but at least in this message, but you know that in the past, uh, communism was this enemy of the United States, the thing called the Cold War. You had both the China and the Soviet Union being these atheistic nations, communistic nations. Um, and the Soviet Union uh, was uh, involved in a Cold War with the United States. Right. So they had the arms race. Uh, they were building up all of these uh, nuclear missiles. Some of it was exaggerated, right? So they had to make it look like they were more powerful than they were. Um, but they definitely developed this nuclear arsenal. And then there was this time of uh, where they, you know, 
I can't remember the call, disarmament or something like that was being pushed for. Was the idea that they could, you know, had enough nuclear power to destroy the earth, whatever, many times over. It would be, however you understood it, if there was a nuclear war, it would be the end of humanity, these types of things. So, so that was, you know, going on for a long time. Now in the 1990s, um, uh, and, and, and even the 1980s. So let's, let's go back to the 1980s before the fall of the Soviet Union. So before the fall of the Soviet Union, um, Reagan had this thing called Star Wars. It was actually a, uh, a missile, a missile defense system that was going to be built up from, uh, satellites. And of course it was mostly smoke and mirrors from what I understand. So this is one of the things that pressured the Soviet Union into um, uh, the positions that it was taking. So it contributed in part to the fall of the Soviet Union. I know some of us older people would remember all of that. Um, uh, so, but we had this Cold War sort of uh, going on. And then we have the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, as far as this movement is concerned, J Jeff is going to look at that. He's going to see that it's a uh, fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40b. And he's going to recognize that it's the time of the end for this generation because he understands the repeat of Millerite history. But what is it that we are not understanding about this dragon power, the Soviet Union, before it falls and even after it falls? What, what is the problem? What is it that we don't understand? Because does the dragon power disappear? In Bible prophecy. If we have the dragon, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so if we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet at the Sunday law, and we recognize the Soviet Union is the dragon power, the idea is that well, that dragon power must move somewhere, right? That'd be a way of looking at it. Now, back then, after the fall of the Soviet Union, I wondered about this. And I said, well, we still have China, right? So there was, there was a move back then, uh, amongst some Bible students to say, well, the Soviet Union's gone. Now the next thing is China, right? And China, of course, being the dragon power makes some sense because dragons are popular in China, right? They're sort of a part of their mythology, right? The, the dragons and and so if you look at um, what a lot of Christians were looking at, I mean, they would look at uh, some chapters in Ezekiel dealing with Gog and Magog and, um, you know, things like that. And they would try to, you know, Rosh, you know, Mishik, that's Russia. And then you're going to have, I can't remember the other name that refers to China. Um, you know, and they try to figure out some way in which this is going to be involved in end time events. But within this movement, uh, we had a much better understanding and within Adventism, much better understanding of um, the threefold union, right? And how, how that comes to play. So with the fall of the Soviet Union, it doesn't seem though that we in this movement understood how that worked. We knew that it moved to the UN, right? That the UN was the globalist power. And yet, why were we still looking at Russia? Um, you know, back in 2017 and 18, why were we looking at Russia in, in our time? Like, so obviously we know Russia. Because, it, is, well, because yeah. it seemed to be the successor to the Soviet Union. Okay, but we already understood that the UN was the dragon power, right? Well, there are some that understood it. There were many that were not. Okay, but within this movement, we, we already had the UN as the dragon power. And, and so it kind of seems peculiar looking back, you know, because hindsight's 50-50. So we look back and we say, well, why did we do that? I mean, why didn't we just recognize that when the Soviet Union fell, the Soviet Union being the king of the south, right, connected to Egypt, 
all those symbols. Why, why did we then not just recognize that it moved, had moved to the UN? Why were we looking for a battle between Russia and the US? A battle which really made no sense to me, right, on, on, on a prophetic level. But that, you know, that's what this movement was teaching. They're saying, okay, you know, Russia and the United States are going to have this conflict. Now, when we look deeper into it with Parminder and Cass, I mean, uh, their ideas were really completely different uh, than what the movement had been teaching. Right. So they were, um, you know, their idea of the battle of the king of the north of the king of the south, it didn't really make any sense. And, and Jeff came to recognize it. Right. So even though initially he would, he had, he had kind of brought in this Russia idea, um, based upon Isaiah, uh, chapter eight, you know, the flood coming even up to the neck, right, dealing with the head, and the head must be Moscow, that's the capital. Instead of recognizing that maybe the head represented Gorbachev himself moving to the UN as a symbol of that characteristic moving from the Soviet Union to the United Nations. So one of the things that we see here then is we see that this idea of globalism um in this first message. So when we look at this first message, the first message arriving, it arrives with the fall of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev, 777 days later, re uh, resigning. And, and then he's going to be appointed to some, in some, a capacity to the UN. He's not going to be the head of the UN, but he's going to move to the UN. Um, <clears throat> have a job there. And then we're going to see we have September 11th show up and t September 11th becomes this formalization in that the United Nations, because of what happens in September 11th, the United States, uh, with this Patriot Act, uh, ties us to these governments of the world. Now, I'm not really quite sure why that happens, right? Why this, and, and I'm not sure I fully understand the Patriot Act in all of its aspects. But what would be the part of the Patriot Act that connects us in some way to the UN? Besides the fact that we go from uh, common law to Roman law, which is, uh, you know, a man's uh, guilty until proven innocent is Roman law. Uh, what else ties us to the UN? So it has to do with this, these international laws. And maybe it, maybe it is about Roman law. But, but what happens with this Patriot Act? It begins to restrict the freedoms of those within the United States and gives rise to a spirit of fear. Okay. And, and it's, um, they can have mandatory detention laws. So they have these provisions for detention laws. So, uh, so a person who is a terrorist uh, doesn't have to abide by the like the United States can can treat terrorists not under American law, but they can treat them as you know they they don't have rights the rights that that all men are given that are inalienable rights that the citizens of the United States have. Uh, we're not going to extend those to people who we believe to be terrorists. Yeah, right? it, it, it basically does away with the fourth and fifth um, amendment, right? Right. Yeah. So it, it, um, yeah. So it, it weakens. Now, how does this tie us particularly to the UN? It removes the validity of the American law and places those within America under the jurisdiction of one that does not observe anything having to do with the Constitution. Right. So it puts us, in a sense, under this world law, right? Agreed. Yeah. And it does so even with American citizens who are involved in terrorism, not just aliens, even though that's originally what it's directed at. Right. So the rights of Americans who are deemed terrorists... Um, or then 
you know, bypassed, right? They're set aside. Now, a lot of this even has to do with things like uh, sending money overseas. There's all kinds of restrictions that occur because of the Patriot Act. I know it affected our church in sending money to uh, the mission field in other countries um, that the church itself would not allow us to send money that didn't go through the church. And they had, you know, odd reasons for not doing, you know, for, for putting that restriction. But really it had to do with the Patriot Act, right? The idea is that money sent overseas could be used for terrorism, right? People familiar with that idea? Yeah, I am. Yes. Yeah. And I know the UN has something to do with that as well. Now, um, so it, it, it's a type of denationalization, I guess is the word, right? Um, so it's denationalization and it's an unconstitutional attempt to revive stripping Americans of their citizenship. There's all kinds of things that occur under the Patriot Act. And, and again, I'm not an expert on it. It's just stuff that I read on the internet, documents that were prepared by different people, uh, a lot of these scholarly documents. Um, so, so the idea is that America, in a sense, yields some of its sovereignty under this uh Orwellianly named uh, Patriot Act, right? So it's it's not really a Patriot Act at all. It's not about patriotism or anything like that. It's about um, fear, government control, and control not of, of of on an international scale. So there's a global aspect to it. Okay. Um, So do we, we feel that, that September 11th then works as a formalization of this movement of the king of the south, the dragon power, all these different ad, uh, adjectives we could use or descriptions of what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union? Does September 11th work as a formalization? I believe it would work as a formalization, yes. And then with uh, Biden becoming president in 2021, is that an empowerment thing? That would look to be logical. And we can think about this movement coming to understand this, right? Because we expect that Trump is going to be the president again. He's going to bring in the Sunday law under his second term. That's the general belief in this movement. Right. Because Trump is the last president of the United States. He's going to bring about the Sunday law. He didn't do it in his first term. So he's got to win the second term. And uh, but he doesn't. And uh, so then, you know, all kinds of theories start developing, you know, once Biden wins the election. Uh, about how that's going to happen, how Trump's going to come back into power. And I guess there are still ideas out there that Trump's going to come back in in 2024 without the election, right? So some people don't think that he, 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 him being elected again uh, would still make him the 46th president of the United States, which they think has to happen. So he needs to not be elected. He just needs to become president. So there has to be some crisis or whatever that is going to make people change their mind about Trump and make him president. So whether that crisis is some kind of civil war or something, I don't know. But different ideas out there. But but we can see when Biden becomes the president, we, we, we understand something about this globalism. And we come to understand then that this is a takeover of the United States by, by the globalists. Now, on a local perspective, this is Republicans and Democrats. So the Democrats represent the King of the South, the Republicans represent the King of the North. And that goes back to the Civil War. Uh, 
in the 1860s, right? So we have Republicans on the, in the North, right? And you have the Confederate Army in the South under the Democrats, and you have this civil war going on. So we can see there's this uh, civil war going on in the United States, and we see the, uh, this victory of the South. Now, one of the things about the Civil War, if, we, if you remember Ellen White's Civil War visions, um, there's going to be a battle called the Battle of Manassas. Um, it's also called, I think, the First Battle of Bull Run. So it depends on which, uh, whether you're in the Northern Army or the Southern Army, how you identify the battle, whether by the town or the body of water that it's nearest. But... Um, so in this battle of Manassas, uh, what are, what is the characteristics of this battle that would, um, be significant? Wasn't well, it one of the bloodiest battles of the war? Okay. Um, okay. It's, it's a bloody battle. How do you spell Manassas? Uh, I'll try this. Okay. So this isn't the best way to do it, but at least I'll find it. Should be able to find it here in a minute. Should be M-A-N-A-S-S-E-S. Okay. Well, yes, M-A-N-A-S-S-A-S. Is how I have it spelled here. So I don't know if I spelt it wrong. Maybe that's why I couldn't find it. I, mean, I thought it was ES, but here it is. Okay, so we have this. This is Ellen White's Civil War Visions. And, and the significance of it is uh, you're going to have Ellen White's first vision on January 12th, 1861. Right? And that's going to be 30 days before the start of the war on April 12th, 1861. And April 12th, 1861 is the first day of the first month. And but there were two battles of Bull Run. Two yes, I know. This is, this is the first one. Right. So you have these 90 days, and then you have the start of this war. And Ella White talks about in this vision, because um, I can't remember who, I think just one of the states had uh, rebelled and, and then other ones had followed but at the time she had the vision she wouldn't have known of the other one she would just know of the first one and she says that this civil war is going to happen and that uh, uh, there's going to be many who have families that die in this war or many families that are going to have sons that die in this war right so it's also it's also interesting because of the Gregorian date January, uh, what are you talking about, January 12th? No. The first, ba- the first Battle of Manassas. As oh, you right, know. right. Yeah, we haven't got there yet. But when we get to the Battle of Manassas, that's January 21, 1861. So the symbol for midnight. But right? it's also, also the symbol of 217, right. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to be 100 days after the start of the war that they have Now, Ellen White has this vision uh, on August 3rd, 1861, where she sees an angel wave his hand backward, causing this retreat of the North. And, And if the North had not retreated, according to people who were there, uh, they would have been slaughtered. Um, So this retreat was an intervention of God, uh, to spare the North um, all of this slaughter. And so even though it was a victory for the South, it would have been a worse victory, better victory. I don't know. depends which perspective you're looking at. Uh, if the angel had not intervened, it would have been a very different war. Um, now, of course, the North was was a bit cocky about it, right? So the fact that they lost, we could see there is a parallel here to the battle of the king of the north and the king of the south at the time of the end sort of thing, right? 
can we see that that um, or not the time of the end? Um, because the time of the end, the what I'm talking about the time of the end in 1798, right? Not in 1989. So you're going to have the south win first, and then the north wins in the next in in the end, right? So that's what's going to happen here. So you can see in this history, there are things that parallel what happened with the United States in in connection with this battle between uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, which we're going to say is the king of the north and the king of the south. So it's, it's a parallel to that history. And then you have 13 days from July 21, 1861 to August 3rd, 1861. So August 3rd, 1861 being 13 days, what does 13 days represent? How many, how many minutes are there in 13 days? Right. And so Iran has it there. Uh, 18,720 minutes. Okay. So, so it's a symbol of July 18, 2020. So we should be able to see that quite clearly. Now, uh, August 3rd, also uh, the significance of that in Josiah Lich's prophecy is that's going to be the date on the Gregorian calendar that is July 27th in 1299, right? So it's going to be August 3rd um, on the Gregorian calendar in 1299 that starts the beginning of uh, the first woe, right? Um, so it's just another little interesting detail about that. Uh, you also have July 21st, 1861 is the 12th day of the third month. So that's March 12th. Um, and uh, uh, there are symbols connected with that, which I guess I can leave out because that's going to be too detailed. But anyway, uh, and then we have these 22 weeks from August 3rd, 1861 to Ellen White's second civil war vision or pardon me her third civil war vision pardon me. so the second one is august 3rd and the third one is january 4th 1862 now what's the significance of 154 days Theodore, 20... yeah can you move your um line to the left a little bit the what your line can you move it to your left a little bit Move the whole line over a little bit to the left. I can't. Be your left. Yeah, I can't. I can't move it to the left. It's as far as as it will go. Okay. Yeah. Because there's see there's if I go like that, that moves it to the right. Can only move it that far to the left. I mean, we could do that. But that's, I'm not sure why you need it moved to the left. You can do that, I guess. Um, so anyway, uh, she's going to have this third vision. So you can see there's three visions. And uh, the third one is 154 days or 22 weeks from her second vision. So what's the significance there? Okay, so 154 is 77 plus 77. So it's it's the number of days, um, if we do an inclusive count, of Samuel Snow's letters. Right? So with Samuel Snow's letters, there's this, his first letter to his last letter. It's 154 inclusive days, 153 um, cardinal days. But we see 22 to two weeks, 22 a symbol of restoration. And if you divided that in half, it'd be 11, 11, right? So, so we can see that that 11, 11 ties to Daniel 11, 11 and the 154 ties to Samuel Stone's letters to our history, et cetera. So there's lots of symbols there. Now, um, and then you're going to see this other stuff. This is just dealing with, uh, after the third vision. Um, the different events, the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, these fasts and thanksgivings. I have the war ends May 9th, 1865. Now, you have a different date for the war ending, Dwight, or is that the date you have? I think you have a different date.
I will look, but that does seem to be correct. I know there was some date that you corrected me on about the Civil War that you had a different idea. Um, and then I have some things about the amendments that were passed um, as well. So I have a lot of things on this chart. But the main thing here is looking at these the symbol of the Battle of Manassas being on July 21st, 1861. That's that's the main thing that I wanted to just point out is that there's this parallel between uh, the history of um, the United States Civil War at the beginning and this civil war in our time. Okay. Yeah. From the from the information that that I have in front of me, mm-hmm. the conclusion of the civil war commenced with the Articles of Surrender Agreement mm-hmm. that was on April 9th. Right. And you have that showing as being May 9th. Okay. Um so I don't is that what I had for May 9th? You showed end of the an end of this uh of the conflict as being May 9th. Yeah, on your last chart. Yeah. Because um so that is a date that's given uh, lots of different places. So the April 9th date is also given as but, I'm looking so, at it right now, yes. Yeah. Um, right. So I think that's the one that you talked about before. That's that's where Lee surrendered. And then the actual ending of the war took place 16 months after that. Yeah. So why do I have May 9th? Uh, because it was five days after. But it, should, it should be April, April 9th, I think. So why do I have May 9th? I don't know. You don't know. Okay. So I'm going to have to fix that. Um, so I'll go back here. It's May, May 9th. What did I have? Is that 1863, 1863? Well, I, I can't see the other chart. Okay. Um, here it is. Yeah. So it should be uh, April 9th. Yes. Up here. Okay, so April 9th, 1865. Then if I go there, I just got to see the biblical date. It'll be someplace in the 11th, or no, in the, in the first month. Okay, uh, the 12th day of the first month is April 9th. It's the 12th day of the first month. Now, if that's the case, you know, maybe I have it corrected over here. Now, this one still has April 9th for May 9th as well instead of April 9th. So I'm not sure why I have that error in these in these charts. So this one's a little bit. Um, so if we go from, so we need to change this to April. That's going to change the number of days. It's going to be 30 days different. So that would be 11. So if I take, uh, I'm going to have to change this chart. So if I take 30 days off that, it's going to be 11. That many days, right? 11, 9, 1. A different symbol. Okay. So anyway, I corrected that. This part I would get rid of. It's a different number of days. Okay. So anyway. Yeah, I just don't know why I ended up with May 9th. Yes. Okay. So they have um, on Wikipedia, April 12th, 1861 to May 26th, 1865. So, and right. I think it is that different people end the war on different dates. But I originally got my date from uh, Wikipedia. 
So I'm not sure why. Anyway. Okay, so that's just correcting some of this these charts. It doesn't really affect what we're doing right now. Um, so, so all I'm saying is that there's a connection between what happens with the north and the south. So we could we can say, even though we have those symbols and we have a separate line of Ellen White's visions and the Civil War, what we can say is that there is uh, the South has a victory in this line uh, over the North, right? That's going to be the empowerment of the first message. And so then we're going to have a second message. So the second message is um, what message? Because right? this is something in our movement. Because this is about uh, our understanding based on external events. How our movement understands the role of the globalists. Now, there's lots of dates, you know, that we could have in in all kinds of ways in, in creating lines. We could create lots of different lines from this. So this isn't the only line. But when it comes to looking at Greece in the context of this entire way mark, Greece is occupying this, uh, I guess it's the Midnight Cry, the Paneum way mark. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure, because we haven't drawn the line above. Um, what that is. But anyway, it's, it's zoomed into some way mark on a line above that includes, uh, uh, whether we include Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, or how, however we do that, we could start with Persia, Greece, uh, pagan and papal Rome. I'm not sure. So I haven't, I haven't thought about that line too much. But here in this line, whatever way mark we're zoomed into, it's addressing Greece. And Greece as the globalists and our understanding of the role of the globalists in this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. That is in our history. So the globalists have this victory over the United States. So the second angel arriving would be what date, what message what is it that needs to be understood? What is God unfolding to us now? And, and what date would symbolically mark that? This is bringing us all the way up to Biden. And so we have to have some message arrive on some date in our history. Notice this line doesn't contain July 18th, right? It's because it's not about July 18th. It's about the globalists and our understanding of it. So we have this internal message within the United States about the King of the South. Now, would the second angel just be the response to that, or is it going to be more about this power um, in prophecy? So that's the question that we we haven't answered yet. So our other line is valid, but this line is just more comprehensive. It's broader. It's a broader line. Okay, so we, we got 2021. That's ending that empowerment of that first message, if that's correct. So what is the second message, and what date would we have that marks this? So it's about globalism. Now we can say, well, there's lots of different events in these, these chapters, right? And, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south in conflict with each other. Okay. Think about our line in 1989. So, so we have this line here, but this line is a reflection of our line. And in our line, we have a symbol, 9-11. 9-11 is both the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. Right? So 
when we look at September 11th as the arrival of the second angel and the empowerment of the first angel, could we take that symbol, the fact that we have a, a date that is doubled, and that we could put that date here four years later and say that this next election is the arrival of the second. So you have a date that's doubled. The empowerment, no, it's a different year, but still the same date, January 20th. And do our lines bring us to January 20th? Do we have that um, response? So now we have a second angel. Okay, second angel's message. Another message that arrives to this movement to give us an understanding about the United Nations and its role as this dragon power in the Sunday law that's coming. So we, we just put that date there. We say, well, we got an election coming up in 2024, and then on January 20th, 2025, we have a new president. Uh, I mean, pretty sure it's not going to be Biden again. Um, but whether it's a Democrat or a Republican and who that would be, we don't know. We could guess, but the lines haven't shown us who that person is, just that it's during the time of a civil war. Um, a, a bloody civil war that president's going to be in, from our understanding of things at this time. Now, if that's the arrival of the second message, uh, what would this message be about? Now, we're saying it hasn't happened yet, right? So we're saying we're going to have a second message arrive in this movement, which hasn't arrived yet. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Now, we have another way of doing it. So even though we put January 20th, 2021 as the empowerment of the first message, we could have put January 6th, 2021 there. And then January 20th, 2021, as the arrival of the second angel, right? I mean, I wouldn't do it that way. But, you know, so the, the, so the siege of Washington on January 6th, you know, could be a way mark in this line, depending what this line is representing. And, and we don't, we don't really have that defined yet. So let's let's go back to Daniel chapter 11 and think about this a bit more. Um, so we're going to uh, this first part of this line. We're going to see 9-11 is here in this history. And then we're going to see in verse. Uh, um, so Daniel 11 verse uh, six you're going to have um, that she's going to lose, so that she shall not retain the power of the, of the arm, lose her position from the former queen, Laodice, decision of the people, loses in a democratic process with the election of Trump. Neither he, Antiochus II, USA, stand, assassinated by Laodice, the election of Biden, right? So that's where we have the election of Biden. It's in verse 6. And so I wouldn't want to put that as the arrival of the second angel. Now, um, so after Biden becomes president, we have some symbols that we used, right? And uh, we had this H6 or H6256, so the Hebrew number 6256, which is 17 years and 46 days. Um, and if you count from a November 5th date, it'll bring you to a December 25th date, right? So in different years, right? Not in any years that we have in our lines. And, and that symbol is going to be used again, that 6256. It also represents uh, 360 days of prophetic year because six times two times five times six equals 360, right? Um, and then... Uh, we also had in there the 10 years connecting the uh, the dates of um, 
the January 20th date as a symbol. Um, what else was there? Now, oh, that was the other one. So out of the branch of her Berenice Wokism's roots, shall one your duties, that is Biden, stand up in his estate. And, and this was a symbol that tied us to December 25th, uh, 2023. So if we counted the word estate, 8141, the Hebrew number, and we counted from September 11th, 2001, it would bring us to December 25th, 2023. So, so we don't have that on this line here because we're, we're going to skip that. We put January 20th here. Now, whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but that's what we put there. So we're, we're leaving out that December 25th, 2023 date, this date. Um, I need to look at the chat or some comments there. Okay, those are what I already looked at. Okay. Because um, initially what I was going to do is put in, so I was going to put this over here. And I was going to put uh, this here, like this. That's what initially I was going to do. <clears throat> So that would that would bring us to this December 25th, 2023 date. Now, the thing is, we don't know what's coming, right? That is, we, we're not sure does December 25th, 2023 mean anything other than a symbol, the symbol of December 25th. Uh, but we have that witness to, right, by a number of things which we're not putting on this line that's on our other line so we know on the other line that we had here we have from uh it's going to be from um the, the beginning of this war and december 24th 79 16,073 days to december 25th 2023 so so all of this stuff here that we have in this line we're not putting in this line <clears throat> Now, one of the things that, uh, just going back to this line, so we do have this fourth angel arriving. And now it could be possible that this line that we're drawing is actually just a zoom into this line, that it's actually, but because we have the January 20th, 2025 as a fourth angel arriving. But I'm not sure what this line is yet. I'm just saying we're taking all of the line of Greece and we're putting it here and maybe we're doing it wrong. But we're trying it out to see if this makes any sense. Okay, so I don't want people to get discouraged because this is 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 difficult. So we have um, so we could do that, but it doesn't give us that January twentieth that doubling of the date. Another option is to get rid of this January twentieth date altogether and look at this line in some other way, right? So how are we going to do this? How are we going to create this line of Greece? Um, if we go back to if we go back to this, because it's it's a very complex uh, information. Maybe what we need to do is is really lay this out just as a text, as a line. What actually the events are. And then see how that fits in with our history, right? So when we went back here, because that's kind of what we did with the first line, uh, we have lots of events, and we just laid out these events. Um, so Biden uh, comes into this power, right? Um, and we have some of these things that repeat, right, that strengthened her in these times, right? Um, so wish I could somehow get this visually so that we can see it all. That's kind of what the line is supposed to help us to do. Um, so 
So in this line here, when we get to verse six, it's going to bring us all the way up to December 25th, 2023 as a symbol, right? That's where it's going to bring us to. And then we have this 391 and a half days to January 20th, 2025. So, so that's where this line that we drew out brought us to. Um, but then we're going to see a lot of these things are repeated. Um, so I don't know. Because when we looked at um, uh, that strengthened her in these times, do we see this later, this, this expression, something close to these, close to this? Yes. Yeah, and that's going to be in, what, verse um, 15? Right, so you always have... Uh, let me see, where was it? Where is the expression? expression. Um, yeah. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to go to the Bible without all this stuff here. So if I click on this verse and I get my treasury of scripture knowledge, um, let me see, what do I have? So there's... Uh, we have this agreement retained. She shall be. I'm going to look at this. Okay. Yes, I didn't hit shares. Sorry about that. Okay. Now you should be able to see it. Um, okay. So you're going to see this in this word strengthened. Okay. And we have the times as well. So we have that word show up a bit. So in this. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, you're going to have strengthened in, uh, uh, it's going to usually be translated as strong. So you're going to have it in Daniel 11 verse 5, Daniel 11 32. Uh, it's going to be strong. You shall be strong and do exploits. Um, as strengthened, it's Daniel 11 6. As um, let's see what other one is better than Daniel. It's Daniel. It's in Daniel ten twenty one quite a bit. But well, there's lots of different ways this word is translated. Okay, but not in Daniel. So it's speak here quite a bit. Strong and strengthened. So what's the idea of this strengthened? Or that he that strengthened her in these times. Because we are going to have later <laughs> strength. So uh, these words, kazaz and strength, are not the same. Koach. One's firm. And you're going to see, but he shall not be strengthened by it. We have another word that's translated strength, azaz. So, and not retaining the power of the arm, right? So we're going to see that showing up. And not standing, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. She shall be given up. And they that brought her they that and they whom she beget, and he that strengthened her in these times. So who's the one that strengthens her in in our history? So what anyway, the point is what we're seeing is a parallel earlier in the vision to what happens later in the vision. Can we agree with that? What happens earlier in Greece is repeated later in Greece. All right, but now as as questions. Okay. The same word strengthen, Kazakh. Yeah. You have it in Daniel eleven six. But then it follows in Daniel eleven seven. Okay. But um, in, in eleven seven it's translated as prevail. Right, there it is. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so prevail. And, and shall then, be strengthened. And then yeah. you follow it with Daniel 11.21. Right, so quite a bit later. But, where uh, it's translated as obtained. Yeah, obtained the kingdom by flatters. Yeah. So this strengthening has to do with um, because it has lots of different meanings, as you can see. Right? And depending on the form as well. But um, so it can be, you know, something that's made strong. It can grow strong. Uh, it means, uh, you know, prevail, be firm, uh, grow stout, rigid, hard, in a bad sense, severe, be grievous. Um, yeah, so, so but getting back to the idea here is that what happens in this history dealing with uh, the king's daughter. So this is wokeism, right? Atheistic communism, whatever it was. We were looking at it. Yeah. In the sense of a religious power, religious ideology, uh, comes to the king of the north, makes an agreement. We're going to put that as 9-11, right? Okay. This would be the, uh, the document that the church has regarding spiritual formation. But also on a broader scale, right? Uh, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. So we know that this word stand keeps showing up again and again. This is, um, um, so, okay. That's where I wanted to go. Right, so, in Daniel itself, it's translated as stood um, in Daniel 1, 19, 8, verse 2 and 3, Daniel 8, 15, Daniel 8, 22, Daniel 10, 11, Daniel 10, 16, Daniel 11, 1. Um, and that one's going to be dealing with also in the first year of Darius, Mead, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. So it's it's a really broad meaning word, it just means to stand, but it can have figurative applications as well as literal applications. It's in Daniel 12, verse 5, where one stands on one side of the bank of the river, you know, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river, right? You're going to see it translated uh, as stand in, in Daniel 11, uh, three times in verses 2 to 4. And, uh, and again in, uh, verses six and seven, and also in verse 14, and verse 16 and 17, and verse 20 and 21, and verse 25, right? So it's going to show up a lot of times in Daniel in that sense. It's also in Daniel 11, 11. So in Daniel 11, 11, um, it's going to be, he shall set forth a great multitude. Well, that word there is the same word, stand. It's also in Daniel 11, 13, right? So again, he shall set forth a multitude greater than the former. So that's that. So again, stand, right? Just Daniel 12, 1. Uh, at that time, shall Michael stand up? So Michael's going to stand up and, um, and he's also going to be uh, standeth, which standeth for the children of thy people. So it occurs in two different ways in that verse. So he's going to stand up, the great pit prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And um, it's also going to be, uh, I don't know why they have stand up itself. Stood, stand, set, because it's translated to stand up. I don't understand why they don't have stand up there. Hmm, that's kind of odd. Um, stand up. Okay, they just have that as stand, I guess. 
I see. So they just, but it's got the word added to it. They didn't put it that way. Okay, so stand, stand up, different ways in which that word occurs um, in Daniel chapter 11. So the idea of this word, uh, if we look at the definition, to stand, remain, endure, take one stand. Um, so to stand still, stop, carry, delay, remain, continue, abide, endure, persist, be steadfast. So it's just a really common word, just like the word to go or to walk, right? A walk, you know, really, really common. Um, but it can be used sort of in a figurative sense. And of course, it's a verb, right? And uh, so you can cause things to stand. That's the hiphal form of Hebrew. And and then the hoffel is to be caused to stand, right? So these are just different ways in which the verb works. Um, hmm. So I'm not really sure how to put this together. I'm, I'm going to have to think more about it. I thought it would be a little, I thought you guys could help me a little more. But if we're going to put this line here, we're going to have to figure out exactly what's happening with this power, Greece. And what is happening with Greece in this history? What is Greece doing? It's trying to take control of the world. Okay. Well, kind of. They're trying to take control of Greece. That is, Greece is in a civil war, right? The rulership of Greece is in a civil war, but as we have been going through this, especially from Daniel 11, 6 forward, they are in a battle with those that would try to claim as being the rulers of Egypt. So this raises it more on a global stage than just a, a limited Grecian stage. Right, I understand. But Egypt's part of Greece, right? Uh, the point that I'm making, because maybe I'll be, be clear here, is that when we looked at Persia, Persia isn't involved in a civil war, right? Persia just has the succession of kings. I mean, obviously, civil war happens. You know, there's rebellions and things that occur. Right. There is there's this succession of these kings, and it represents the United States. This two horn power, it's it's got a constitution, the law of the Medes and the Persians, right? So it's a republic in that sense. So so it, it represents the United States in in our history, and then. But it's also going to focus upon these kings of Persia, which we take from Revelation 17, to refer to these presidents of the United States from the time of the end, just symbolically. But, but, you know, they're, but it's in our time of the end, 1989, that we can now place these presidents. Prior to that, nobody could really understand the seven kings of Revelation 17. And actually, you can't understand them until the time of the one is which I think to me is pretty remarkable, but also logical, right? Because until you're in the one is, how can you know what the one is? You have to be in that time in the present tense to know that. So if somebody's going to say, well, the one is, is, you know, somebody in the past, somebody in the future, but that doesn't really make any sense that you could identify that one in the future. And if it's one in the past, of course, that could be the case. But you would have to say that it would have to be recognized at the time that the one is. And was the beast that was and is not, was he in a sense recognized in the time that the one is? The beast that was and is not. It's, it's sort of at the time that it is not that it becomes identified. Right, 1798. So 
So the point here is that we have this with Persia. Now with Greece, well, Greece is representing the United States in this battle over these ideologies, right? Because Greece is the UN. It's battling for the United States, right? You know, to gain that territory. So there's a battle going on within the United States as a civil war between the North and the South. And we're saying that the North represents, what well, we say it represents the United States as opposed to the globalists. So it, it represents maybe nationalism, maybe would have been a better way to look at the King of the North. And you can see that in the American Civil War in the 1860s. Why was the North fighting the South? It was trying to retain the Union, right? It was trying to retain the Union, but the other thing was is that there, from a lot of things that were being printed before the war began, there were those that felt there could be no Union with slaveholding states. Right. Yeah, so, so in the United States, slavery is part of the issue. It, it's not yeah. the only issue. Um, the thing that, you know, from my perspective, I, I've never really understood why they just didn't let the South succeed. Okay, go, go have your own country. You understand what I'm saying? That because the states, in a sense, didn't they have a right to succeed from the Union? At this at, at this point, and as this country has continued, there is yeah. only one state that has retained full sovereignty, even as it is currently a member of the United States, and that is Texas. Okay. All of the others agreed to join into a union for the common defense against other foreign powers, meaning Great Britain, meaning France, meaning Spain. Yeah, so the reason that they had these union of these states, the United States, um, was for military defense primarily. Correct. The states themselves had a lot of different types of thought. They were states, right? They weren't provinces like in Canada. Right. They were states. And, and so you have this union. But, but the fact that some of those states decided not to be part of the union, I, I don't, I don't fully understand why the North didn't just allow them to be separate, right? Well, okay. Were they, did they see them as a threat? No, the, the point was the North had the economic engine, the money. The South had the other portion of the economic engine, which was the labor. Okay. One, one cannot survive without the other. You can have all the labor in the world. But if you don't have if, if you don't have the money to make things go forward, you have no no economic engine. This is why Great Britain was being so very focused on wanting to be able to get the goods from the South without having to pay the prices that the North wanted. OK. OK, so so I think part of the solution to this, I mean, is understanding these battles between the North and the South in the context of the American Civil War. Yes, David. Right. Now, one of the things that uh, Heidi and I did back in 2018, when we were there at the School of the Prophets, is Heidi's the one who noticed this battle of Manassas. And Ellen White's, she was reading about Ellen White's visions. Um, and and then we recognized right away that, you know, there was these three visions and we looked at the dates and I put them on the biblical calendar. And it was like, well, this is, you know, extremely profound. We should, um, you know, tell people about this. And as we started looking at it further, um, we saw that this civil war was connected with 
the Civil War in 977 BC when the North and the South of Israel split. It was connected with the Civil War in 742 BC. And, and then it was connected to the Civil War occurring in our time, right? And this was the November 22nd uh, prediction, right? So um, that we might notice today that it's November uh, 23rd, but in this November 22nd prediction back in 2018, um, in 2018, December or November 22nd was... Um, I just get it. It was it was Thanksgiving, right? So in 2018, pardon me. Um, November 22nd was Thanksgiving. So we had this Thanksgiving Day prediction. And and we were going to present it on uh the Wednesday. We had the prayer meeting on Wednesday, and we knew Thanksgiving was coming up the next day. And so we thought, well, this would be a good time to present this uh before the event that, did, that might be connected with this prediction. But we are told, no, it's, it's shut down. Even though you're scheduled to do a uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday, we're not going to have prayer meeting because tomorrow's Thanksgiving or the day after tomorrow, because this was on the Tuesday, on the 20th, uh, that we wanted to, to look at this. And um, so it's part of the thing that ended us getting kicked out of the School of the Prophets was this November 22nd, Thanksgiving Day prediction. But the thing that we were looking at was, well, can we make predictions? Can we predict something in advance? Now, on November 9th, 2019, um, well, I guess it was November 10th, the day after November 9th, we did, I did three presentations about, uh, this prediction. So even though I was there and we were talking about July 18th, the only thing that they were interested in talking to me about was the prediction I had made the year before. And me and Stephen were there in Odilio. And uh, my wife watched the first presentation on, I zoomed it on my phone, or Skyped it. And um, she did, couldn't bear to watch the next two because uh, it was just so ridiculous what was being said. So the idea was somehow that I had made this failed prediction, which of course, it's true, right? That is, that was the whole point, is that I could not predict what was going to happen before it occurred, even though I had this structure that Jeff agreed with. He said, everything in this structure, we already know. It's just you've solidified the connection of what's happening now with these other civil wars between the North and the South, right? Northern, Northern and Southern Israel, both in what we would call, you know, if you're going to compare what happened, it's it's like the American Revolution, and then in 742, it's like a civil war, and that we could connect the revolution and the civil war in 1863. So not just the civil war, but the revolution as well. And, and then also connect that to our history. But the idea is that we couldn't, we couldn't predict what those events were, would be, right? So, you know, we're Thanksgiving in 2023. It's hard to believe that that's five years later. Um, but that's, that's where we're at, right? As far as, you know, time has passed in this movement. So this is something that we need to examine further. So I think the key to understanding Greece and these battles on the north between the north and the south, just as we did when we looked at um, Persia, is we have to look at other places. Now, in the scriptures, we have these battles, right? We have what happened in 977 BC. We need to look at that. And we have what happened in 742 BC. So we need to look at that. And then we can connect that to our history. Does that make sense to people? That we need to, yeah, we need to look at these civil wars that are the parallel to our history in the Bible. And then also what happened in American history. So I think that's the only way that we're going to really sort this out. Um, 
And, and that's one of the things we wanted to do back in 2018. Right? So when we proposed this, when we put together this line, we said, we need to examine this. And, you know, for a lot of different reasons, suspicions and all these different types of things that people have, uh, nobody was interested in looking at. Now, later, you're going to see pre tests presenting on the Civil War, right? Now, it's not a very good presentations on it because she doesn't, she doesn't understand the chronology of it. She doesn't really look at Ellen White's Civil War visions. She just kind of looks at the Civil War and, and makes some parallels which are incorrect. Um, but she was trying to do what we had already started doing. Didn't really make sense that she could do it, but we couldn't, you know, as a group, right? Because I'm not saying just me and Heidi, but everyone needed to study it. And I think, you know, it would definitely help us understand this history. So that's what we're going to do with, uh, with this next week. So I think that will help us sort out, because uh, what we can then do is we can have a parallel between these different histories. And, and that should help us. A any final thoughts on this before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you have done in our lives. Grateful for the people uh, that uh, are studying and searching for truth. And we're thankful for your grace and power that you can give us peace in the midst of conflict. We know, Lord, that in each of us, a civil war is going on between uh, Christ and Satan over us and the battle for our souls. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, we can side with Christ, the true king of the north, and uh, that Satan can be vanquished. Uh, we pray for your angels' care and protection of each person, that you can watch over us in, in all ways. And we pray, Lord, that you can be with the meetings uh, tomorrow evening on Sabbath, and that you can bring us together Sunday morning to once again open your word and look at Daniel chapter 11. Thank you again for all your blessings. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.